Hi again, uh, this is Daryl Baskin. I'm a retina specialist in San Antonio, Texas. I want to take a moment to talk about a PVD, a posterior vitreous detachment. I hate to use the D word because I usually re like to reserve that for a retinal detachment, but it is common parlance to say PVD, posterior vitreous detachment. I typically use the term or the phrase vitreous separation in my clinic. What am I talking about? So I uh, posted an eye anatomy video not, not too long ago, um, but just a brief overview. The vitreous gel sits inside of the eye, just behind the lens, firmly adherent to this space, lightly adherent to the optic nerve. Think of it as a jello-filled water balloon. Sorry if I'm not holding this up high enough. And it deflates slowly over time. That sort of collapses on itself. And if it can happen as early as I've seen it, as early as in the 20s, as late as the 80s or 90s, the average person gets a vitreous separation or a PVD sometime in their 50s or 60s. If you're more nearsighted, you're gonna have it happen earlier in life. If you have trauma, you may have it happen earlier in life. Basketball players get poked in the eye, their vitreous gel is more likely to collapse at an earlier age. Um, other risk factors include bleeding in the eye or inflammatory disease. If you've had eye surgery, like cataract surgery, if you have no lens in your eye, there's a lot of reasons to get a PVD. But for most people, it's just, one of those things that comes with life, uh, and it, you are more likely to get it, again, if you just had cataract surgery. Um, I think of the cataract surgery as sort of being the straw that breaks the camel's back. Like, it was about to happen maybe in a couple of years. Because you, the cataract surgery happened, maybe it's now happening a couple years earlier. Um, so again, PVD, fairly common. About I, close to 70 to 90% of people have one before they turn 90. So it is a very common thing to happen, but it's not necessarily a safe thing to happen. So, what would the symptoms be? First off, uh, what I hear in my clinic is, Dr. Baskin, I, I saw some flashes of light. I was turning off the lights in my room and I saw these flashes of light off to the side. Or, Dr. Baskin, I, when I look at a bright blue sky, I see these tiny little dots. Or I see a C-shaped float or an O-shaped float. And if I pursue questioning a little bit more, I might find out that it floats around like seaweed underwater. Um, what happens is when that gel collapses, it pulls away some small elements from the optic nerve, from the surface of the retina, and then the eye can now see those floating around inside of itself. And when that happens, it's quite disconcerting, and it should be. I, it bothers me a little bit to think that there's a lot of people that don't have any symptoms and go through life and, well, I mean, some people are fine, right? I mean, if you don't have any symptoms and you never have a retinal tear detachment, you are fine. But when we, we see the people that come into our clinic, Everybody with those symptoms, flashes of light, a few floaters, maybe a hazy little kind of diaphanous curtain-like thing that's kind of right in the middle, uh, which is different from a curtain that starts from the periphery. I'll get into that in a moment. But when those symptoms, flashes, floaters, a patient comes in, they have a 7 to 10 to 15 percent chance of having a retinal tear. How does it happen? A tear can form as that gel pulls away. Once it pulls away from the optic nerve, that starts to fairly aggressive, radical separation of the gel from the retinal surface peripherally. And when it pulls away, it can tear the retina. It's like pulling, put, picture some tissue paper right here, and then sometimes that gel is adherent like maybe scotch tape on that tissue. As you pull that scotch tape off, it's just going to tear the tissue. That's, a, that's how fragile the retina is. And in some cases, you can have multiple tears on the retina. When those tears occur, there may be some additional floaters, some, maybe some blood, some red blood cells that float around. You may see this shower of blood. You may, your eye may fill up with blood. It may not. Um, so when you have those symptoms, I always recommend see a retina doctor, see a general ophthalmologist, somebody you trust with your eye. Ideally, it's nice if they have wide field photography so they can look around. Or in, in my case, as a retina doctor, I like to do scleral depression, which means after I dilate the pupil, I uh, shine a lot of bright lights, pretty annoying, and then I push on the eyelids just a little bit to indent the eye to bring in that peripheral retina so that I can see it in profile and really scrutinize in, in minute detail and see if there is a tear. If I see some blood, their risk of having a retinal tear is a little bit higher. Some studies say as much as 50% chance. Um, so not, so not all, I'll, I'll take one more quick side trail, not all blood is related to a tear. So sometimes a tear can happen and it can rip through one of these blood vessels that you can see depicted here, but sometimes it just sort of aggravates or tears the endothelium, the blood vessels right in, in this region or next to the optic nerve. Am I holding that up high enough? And then that can uh, allow some blood to form. And usually that blood will be kind of central 
You may pool at the bottom of the eye, uh, but if you see blood diffusely throughout the eye or anywhere in the eye, your suspicion should be high for a retinal tear and the patient I follow my patients closely when that happens. I don't want to miss a retinal tear. If the eye's full of blood, that's a discussion about whether we should go to surgery right away, get the blood out, and look for tears. So a tear, once it happens, it can also lead to a detachment if it's not caught. Um, and even when sometimes we treat a retinal tear, it can still lead to a detachment. So we treat retinal tears with cryo, which is like a freezing therapy, or we treat them with laser, depending on where the tear is and, and how the clinician, the doctor, feels comfortable treating it and uh, we'll probably follow that pretty closely as well. We wanna see that laser pigment and that laser or the freezing treatment forms a glue or a, a, it's like actually a destructive process that then causes adherence between the, the retina and the eye wall itself, but it doesn't go as fast as super glue. It actually is very slow. It takes five to seven days. So we like to follow closely, uh, make sure our detachment doesn't form. About 5% of the time after freezing treatment or laser, 5% of the time a detachment can still happen. So if you see a shadow, this is a little bit different than what I said earlier, a curtain or shadow that's maybe opaque, maybe a little bit diaphanous, but it starts from the bottom or the top or the sides, any peripheral direction, and then slowly kind of marches in, it does not go away with blinking, that would be very concerning for a retinal detachment. So those are some basics about floaters and why you should see an eye doctor to get that checked out. Uh, and just because your friends already have floaters doesn't mean you should ignore yours. Sudden onset of floaters at any stage of life should get checked out. There's other causes of floaters that we're not going into, inflammatory causes, but for now just know floaters should equal a visit with your eye doctor. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Till next time.